Um, I'm also an instructor of sculpting course through Workman Arts and um, feverishly <laughs> Uh, working on other public art proposals as we speak. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, David. We are also joined by our three panelists today, uh, Lisa Wagner. Lisa is a mad and disabled public artist and storyteller. Lisa's fascination is to create an immersive multi-sensory universe in which to play and invite her audience to share in the overriding theme of her art, which is liberation through dreaming. She believes that we're all born artists until the world knocks it all out of us. Lisa's work also encompasses films, large-scale art installment installations, live performances and disruptions and social experiments. Thank you, Lisa, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, yeah, I realized in the last few years that being a public artist had become a uh, increasingly important to me. I have a piece called Intangible Adorations Caravan in residency with Artworks TO. Um, it is uh, by uh, mad and disabled artists mm -hmm. for uh, mad and disabled community. It happens to be great for everybody, um, but I've been really interested also in the vital integration of disability culture. And I think in public art, that's a place that's it's really great for. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Next, we have Catherine Dean. Catherine Dean is a public art officer at the City of Toronto, and as a part of the <clears throat> pardon me, and as a part of the culture division, Catherine organizes public art projects from completion to installation, including managing the annual program of the Toronto Sculpture Garden. Prior to her work at the city, she was also an independent curator and photo editor at many of Canada's major magazines. Thank you, Catherine. Oh, I think, um, Catherine, I think you might be muted or the volume might be a little low. Oh, I How about perhaps that? the headphone. Did that work? Yep, yeah, <laughs> I can hear you now. <laughs> All right, I am the first technical problem of the talk. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I don't have a lot to add to that, except that I'm currently working on a lot of different projects. Um, one um, or three new co um, competitions that are uh, spread around the city, one on Humber mm -hmm. Bay, one out in uh, the west end of Scarborough, and one in Lawrence Heights. So each of those is sort of, it's always sort of the best part of, of the process going through the competition. and finding out who actually got these. And we've had some really amazing artists apply to all of them. Um, and we're definitely putting a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about today into those new competitions. Thank you very much, Catherine. And next uh, we have Joe Sellers, who is the project lead for Artworks TO, Toronto's Year of Public Art 2021. Joe is committed to successfully launching the city, the city of Toronto's new 10-year public art strategy with impact to bring the city to its feet and is stronger than ever before, using art as a tool to engage and to energize the public. Playing multiple roles over 13 years at the city of Toronto, Joe has worked with a variety of high-profile artists, leading the realization for, of several large-scale projects via roles as the manager of programming in the city of cultural events and production lead for Nuit Blanche Toronto. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. You guys can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, yeah, happy to be here. Thanks a lot. Project Lead currently, um, lots going on, but uh, Artworks TO, which is actually, you know, the public face of the new 10-year public art strategy that we're trying to kick off. So we'll use it. We'll do a year of um, raising awareness for the existing collection, also maybe looking at changing policy for how the city of Toronto produce um, uh, public art across the city moving forward. Um, myself, I'm a generalist. Uh, I'm not necessarily a subject matter expert when it comes to some of these bigger, um, uh, bigger, broader questions that, uh, that face us as a city. So my role is to pull together uh, the divisions, you know, Catherine Dean representing the public art office, transportation, city planning, and some of these other key stakeholder divisions that Mm -hmm. that have art programs within the city of Toronto and secondarily uh, other divisions that don't necessarily produce art but want to produce art so we're trying to really make this a city-wide effort mm -hmm. uh, currently the interdivisional working group is 16 divisions wide out of 54 I think it is um, so we're we're growing strong and uh, and I'm excited to uh, kick off the year when it when it does come 
Thank you so much, Joe. And um, for myself, uh, my name is Kais. I am the Interim Public Programming and Partnerships Manager at Workman Arts. We are a multidisciplinary arts organization that promotes a greater understanding of mental health and addiction issues through the creation and presentation. Um, on the topic of public arts, um, public engagement, even mentioning the word public, we were reminded that we are still currently navigating the COVID-19 pandemic. And this being so, um, to what extent has COVID-19 impacted the first year of public art strategy? And how has this plan been adjusted to include virtual activations or showcases as such? And Joe, this is a question that I'd first like to um, pass over to you. Sure, you got to just cut right to the chase, eh? So uh, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, of course, uh, many of you might know by now that the, the year of public art, our work still has been postponed. Uh, we will now be launching in September, and that was a hard decision to make. But in tandem, uh, working with the mayor, uh, Mayor Tory, and his and his staff, we found, um, and knowing what we know now about the virus and the pandemic, um, it was the right thing to do. We wanted to ensure an impact. We don't want this year of public art to go lightly and quietly. Um, it, the intention is to to make change, and we felt as though um, making sure that we got outside of you know obviously lockdown and everything else that we're in right now, and allowing the vaccine to to get into arms we felt as though september was the right choice mm -hmm. and potentially using using um you know key key projects like a new blanche in order to kick off uh the year of public art and also on the back end you know maybe cap cap it off uh you know in september of 2022 but uh yeah it's definitely caused some delays but in the meantime i will say this um before passing it on is that it's allowed us to slow down a little bit and actually actually um actually do some real planning on some of these programs that we want to roll out mm -hmm. secondly it's allowed us to um to actually get in the market a little bit more do more marketing do more promotion and do more fundraising uh our work steel has a as a very very broad fundraising campaign we we've made a commitment to city council to match uh city funding mm -hmm. um of 4.25 million so we have to raise 4.25 million in order to match that um and we're about halfway there and keep in mind, all of those dollars, for the most part, get spit right back out the door in order to fund net new projects, artists, curators, cultural institutions, in order to do projects in response to the year of public art. So it's allowing us to actually build that program a little bit more. Um, and our partners are in the hundreds right now. So we're really, really excited to, to, to reveal and launch the programs when September does come. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and Captain, I'd like to also extend the question over to you and how um, the pandemic has uh, affected your department and what are some of the priorities and strategies um, for yourself moving forward um, as we you know currently uh, navigate our way forward um, yeah i think i mean the same as the same as joe and uh in some cases you know very much with joe because i've had a a couple of projects that are um, that were supposed to be over the winter and then were supposed to be over the summer and are now probably going to be in fall, maybe even next spring. Um, so that's been kind of an interesting process to work through with artists, sort of as as everyone decides on their comfort levels and what what is really the most important to them about their projects. Uh, one of them is actually a series of dance performances, which is very new as a Toronto Sculpture Garden idea. Um, and so they had to decide whether they were interested in doing it just sort of as a live stream with no audience or if it was important to them to actually be able to at least have a few people to mm -hmm. really interact with. And they decided that the, actually bringing that to people was what counted the most for them. So it's been kind of, it's been an interesting process to, to go through with artists as everybody is always mm -hmm you know, having to change permits and adjust things as they go. But it's it's also been really just kind of a, a great process because everyone is so, you know, just so patient and so, you know, accepting of, of what we need to work with and and just really want to do the best things they can for, for Torontonians eventually. Um, on our more long-term projects, the difference has mostly been that we can't do any in-person public consultation, which mm -hmm. in some cases has actually worked out kind of well because 
computers for an hour, then we'll come to a library or a community center to listen to you talk about public art. Um, and we've also started some new online um, surveys that people can access more easily. And uh, we've been working quite closely with the counselor's offices for those that kind of outreach and then just doing a ton of outreach in any way we can think of. So while it is nice to be able to actually go and talk to people and spend time in the community, it's also uh, worked out fairly well in some other ways that we'll probably continue to incorporate into our process, even when we can do in-person meetings. Thank you so much for those insights, Catherine. And on the topic for artists having to um, in orient, reorient themselves and pivot, uh, Lisa, it, um, um, our understanding is you are also taking part in the public art, um, or in the Artworks TO uh, artist residency. Would you like to speak more towards your experience? In, um, Oh, well, actually, so what that meant, what that means to me, the residency, when I said it, is that my project is in residency mm -hmm. with artworks. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what I want to bring up with the with the pivoting mm -hmm. um, about it is actually the whole project was born because of COVID. Mm -hmm. I originally was was planning on programming this into a gallery and literally building a space to put it into. So the idea of putting it onto a, a truck and to ha and to going into public places with it was was a COVID idea, and now I think I'm so glad that we that we had to pivot that way, and it really actually, like I said, suits my mandate better and really fits. Um, and we were planning on going ahead this summer for a little while. We thought we might have very small audiences. We had already designed it with public, uh, with um, uh, social distancing in mind. We had designed it even farther um, mm -hmm. and we were ready to go ahead. And then when it was pushed now, because we're a summer project, we are now going to waiting for next summer. Um, that actually allowed me also to raise more funds towards it. I realized the accessibility expenses to make this really accessible are actually almost double what I thought at first. So the push of COVID allows me to raise, raise additional money and really make this work exceptionally well. So, uh, and also my, uh, my disabled performers were quite stressed about having to go into the world this summer. So the actual additional push has actually really helped the project. Mm. So that's me personally with the pivoting of COVID. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, and so for some of us who might not be familiar about the public art strategy and some of um, its key areas of focus, um, could you please um, elaborate on what the public art strategy entails and what are some of those areas of key focuses and strategies, um, Joe? Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, you know, Catherine Dean is a great subject matter expert, but at base, the 10 year public art strategy, it went through a, a pretty rigorous process in order to create the plan. It's not a master plan, it's a strategy at this point. So the year of public art is there in order to sort of play out what that strategy uh, is, um, which is based in 21 guiding principles. Uh, everyone, everything with, with the forefront, with a focus on indigenous, um, indigenous placemaking, um, getting citywide outside the core, um, focus on BIPOC artists and curators and cultural institutions, and, uh, and based in equity. So, uh, and again, Catherine Dean can really uh, shore up some of the, my minor comments here, but, uh, um, the, the Artworks TO, uh, the Year of Public Art, has its own strategy framework, which is derived from the 10-year public art strategy framework. Um, so, so those are the key pieces, but, uh, you know, I would hand over to my colleague, Catherine, in order to, to, uh, to fill, in, uh, fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a, a really good synopsis. So there are 21 um, points or major recommendations for the strategy, but... Um, it does really come down to just a greater diversity of artists in terms of background, but also in terms of practice and media, and not just having the same kind of art be sort of what everyone thinks of as public art in the city. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot from people and that we heard through it, the process of, um, of putting the strategy together was that there isn't enough public art distributed around the city. And so getting out into different neighborhoods um, and having art and artists who are appropriate to those neighborhoods, who may be from those neighborhoods and have direct experience of different parts of the city is an important part of it. Um, and I think that having um, the process be more diversified as well. Um, 
more diverse people on the selection panels that we have, uh, people who have more experience in the neighborhoods where the art is going to be, who are selecting the work. Um, so there's a lot of different components to that. Um, and then definitely having different types of artworks so that not everything has to be a gigantic high budget permanent artwork, but there's different ways of getting people involved in other types of work and different sort of ways for people to access public art as producers, as artists who may not have the experience working on gigantic construction projects or who may not be interested in working on gigantic construction projects because that's not what everybody really wants to do. Um, so it's really just thinking about public art and what it could be and what it can mean to people and who can make it and where it goes sort of more broadly across the whole city. And yeah, just to just add on, yeah, it's a complete bit of a redefinition of what public art will be in the city of Toronto moving forward. I mean, the year of public art can, is used as a test bed, right? Like whenever do we have an opportunity to do a whole year of just trying stuff out. And then when the year is done, then we go, this worked, this doesn't work. Let's do what worked and let's do that more. And then we roll that out, we change policy, we put it through council and, uh, and you know, everything works out after that. So uh, it's a great opportunity. I think we're all really excited at the city of Toronto. Thank you so much, Joe and Catherine. Um, David. Hello, yeah, okay. Can you hear me okay now? Okay, great. Uh, I extend this question to, to all three of the, of the panels here, uh, members, um, to Lisa, Catherine, and Joe. Um, the question is, what is the function of public art? Uh, what will the function of public art change in terms of commanding and directing the attention of the public? Uh, for example, uh, would this allow for temporary public art to be used as a platform to address current social political? Um, issues such as Toronto housing crisis or systemic racism, uh, both topics that are currently um, being had right now uh, from different communities in within Toronto. I extend it all to the three people participating in the panel. <laughs> Lisa, do you want to start? Um, sure. Well, I suppose, uh, actually, can you just ask the question again? Like, so is it, what does public art just ask what the is, first? What is, again, yeah. What is the function of public art? Um, how would it function to, um, for the public? Uh, how would the function of public art change in terms of commanding and directing attention of the public? I suppose for me, um, I am really keen on unexpected delivery of art and disruptions. So for me, public art is the perfect way to deliver um, a, a funded piece to the public. So it's also not so that the public doesn't have to pay for it. So I guess, um, yeah. So I guess I, I personally, as an artist, just love that ability to, yeah, disrupt and to kind of just bring a bit of magic in an unexpected place. And my project is one of those, uh, yeah, basically we're bringing a, a, tra a traveling caravan into a neighborhood. We're going to all come out of the truck, do a show for an hour, pop back in the truck and leave. So not your traditional public art, uh, kind of, yeah, more like old school vaudeville almost. Um, but I feel I'm very, very pleased to be able to present this kind of thing. Um, to the public. And again, I'm especially excited to not have to charge ticket money. That's very important to me. So those are my think, initial thoughts. I think it's interesting because originally this project was contextualized within a gallery. And now you're offering it to people who necessarily won't enter this white box of a gallery. And then it brings it, diplom um, not diplomatic, but it brings it out um, to the public. To the public, yes. And I feel a little bit like, well, this is also the story of my disability and we're all disabled folks. So it is actually also, it's a magical piece that is quite universal, but it is actually my heart and my story. So I think that's a really cool thing that, uh, that yeah, that I can sort of disrupt with that. And, and people will know where it is, but we're going into very public places. So there's gonna be lots of people that are like, what, what on earth is this? And then they can come into my world for an hour. Um, and the, to be able to do that really just thrills me. So that's one aspect I just find thrilling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
I, I love the question, David, and I'm gonna put I'm gonna put a COVID lens on it. I know there's a lot of COVID talk these days, and I know we're exhausted, but we don't want to talk about it anymore. But uh, I'm excited to talk about it because let culture lead, let culture lead recovery, right? So, uh, and we spent a lot of time at the city talking uh, talking about this element. Um, we've had some really good learnings over the last uh, six to twelve months on how to respond to a pandemic and how artists um, uh, can help us. Uh, recover uh, and this on, on multiple uh, platforms. So, um, you know, we, we had some great success with Show Love TO. We, we launched a program called uh, Big Art TO, which is large scale projections projected onto buildings 25 wards wide across the city of Toronto. They're passive experiences, so people can just experience them as they're going to the grocery store or walking their dog or whatever the essential need is. You know, because Dr. Davila has said that exercise is okay, so go ahead, leave your house, but otherwise, um, uh -huh. Uh, stay home. So trying to capitalize on those opportunities. You know, we even talk about putting art at, at you know, at the grocery store or at Costco's because people are going there because they need to. So these are things that we're talking about to so essentializing uh, how art uh, can be represented. Um, you know, we, we need to help our businesses and our main streets get back to life when the time comes. Um, so using art in order to, you know, reimagine storefronts. So like a vacant storefront program is another thing that we've been talking about. And there's a lot of movers out there uh, that, that are doing this already. So the city is trying to come in and figure out how we can help and how do we shore up uh, existing uh, existing efforts. But um, I'm really excited to have artists and culture lead, lead in recovery. Uh, and it's, it's been uh, a great, it's been a great experience working with uh, many of the folks out there. Yeah, I would I would definitely ag agree with everything that Lisa and Joe said. Um, I think another interesting part of your question is about sort of um, current current ideas in our, in public space, like just sort of um, in the world generally at the moment that artists are very good at addressing and um, bringing people into as ideas. And I think that's one thing that public art can be very very useful for um you're right that it's more often in this sort of temporary format which is something that i think that artworks will be will be great for and as joe says we're going to learn a lot about what works and what doesn't as we go through that process um but it is definitely uh it's definitely something that we that we think about in the sort of longer term projects too like what are the what are the things that people can talk about, but also how can they bring more people into that process? Even if it is the construction of a large scale sculpture, how can more community members be involved in that? And it's something that we're, um, that we're trying to bring into our standard competitive process. But I think as we go through this discussion about how public art can be different, I think it should definitely be about how can public art talk about different things as well? Because I think there's a reason that a lot of public art is abstract because it doesn't necessarily say a specific thing to anybody and it can stay there for a long time and not change too much. Um, but there are certain things that you really want to talk about in public space that you don't want it to necessarily be there for a hundred years. Um, and that's something that public art can be very good at as well. Yeah, I, uh, just to um, add to that, I think there's, there is a lot of value to possibly seeing public art as a vehicle for reflection to offer um, to a, for, from a community to a community to the public to reflect on current events uh, that are happening now and maybe that's all it is maybe it's only for a week for two weeks for three months for six months but as a reflection and uh, and if you're passing by this artwork uh, whichever way that it's uh, manifested um, it's a reminder and it is part of our healing uh, part of our narrative that that we are living with uh, with current topics. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And we've also touched a little bit upon uh, this within the previous question, but uh, in terms of what public art reveals about the fabric of the city. So how will public art encourage and reveal the cultural fa fabric of the city's diverse community uh, groups and communities? So Joe had made the comment earlier, um, you know, letting culture lead us out, the culture being at, you know, the forefront of our recovery. What does the, how will public art reveal 
what those culture or cultures look like in the sense of uh, leading us forward? Yeah, I think, I think it starts with opportunity. Um, and that opportunity comes from um, getting across the city as a whole. So, you know, speaking directly for the artworks TO team, we're creating and we're going to stand up uh, community cultural hubs. So one out in Etobicoke at Cloverdale Mall, one up uh, North York, uh, Downsview, and then Scarborough Town Center in Scarborough, and then downtown will be Union Station. So these are places that um, that, that they have multiple um, uh, multiple purposes. Number one is people can come learn about the year of public art and all the programming and everything that's going on. Number two, they can learn about public art and what it is, and maybe actually learn about how they can see themselves reflected in public art. And thirdly, give feedback. What, what do they want to see in public art? So it's a, it's, a, it's a point of contact for people to come and ask questions and also give feedback that we need to listen to, right? We need to understand what people want to see and what people want to hear in their communities. But to, to uh, close my answer and try to answer your, your question um, fully, uh, I think um, getting out there is the important part. So getting out into communities, getting into 25 wards, uh, there is, you know, we call them art deserts, as art deserts across the city, uh, mainly outside the core. Seventy percent of our public art is downtown core. Seventy percent of the population is outside the core. So we need to we need to balance that a little bit more. And I think um, the year public art and the ten year public art strategy as a whole is forcing that, and uh, it's not going to let it go. So uh, I'm excited to to get that going. And if I may ask a follow up question to that. Um, so in terms of community outreach and going out there to communities, how do we go about establishing trust with communities who have, you know, historically been marginalized, not listened to or consulted with? What does the outreach process look like and how do we look and how do we sustain and grow trust uh, in the long term phase? Well, personally, I won't I won't pretend to know the answer to that fully. Uh, I think I think I would love to hear people's opinions on that in order for us to adjust. Mm -hmm. um you know we we sometimes uh and i'll speak personally we sometimes at the city we're really good at mainstream marketing right we're really good at at the big umbrella uh, marketing picture but sometimes when it comes to a specific community or um or a specific people we we we, we need to work better at it so um so i think i think we're starting to learn with some of the partners and the executive committees that we're working on and how how to reach uh reach everyone um so it, for me, it's been a total learning process uh, because we have to, especially in these COVID times, right? We're asking people to to stay local, to to you know stay within their own communities and not travel across the city. city. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think uh, I think uh, yeah, I think community is key. Sorry, um, but uh, we're learning too. Thank you. Um. Catherine, would you like to add to the? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll just I'll just agree with that. Like we, um, I think we we try to do our best to get our especially open calls. Like we do everything through an open call, so it is technically open. But I don't know that that means that it's absolutely welcoming to everyone, or that it is, or it even gets to everybody, or that people feel that it's aimed at them like there's just so many different options and and it would be nice to make those open calls seem as inclusive as possible so that we can work with more artists and maybe people who wouldn't have thought of themselves as public artists before um, and then i think the same thing for community consultation like the the more that we get feedback from people about what we should be doing differently the better um, and sometimes Sometimes it works really well and sometimes it just doesn't. So um, I think it's something that we we definitely want to work on and are trying to work on. And I, again, I think that Artworks is gonna be a really useful, useful tool for that. Like we'll learn a lot from that process and hopefully meet a lot of new people who feel included in this in public art in Toronto and will continue to be part of it. Thank you so much. And in, in regards to community consultation, uh, what role, um, if any, will post-secondary art institutions play in shaping the city's public art strategy? So for example, OCAD University, 
being a university used as, as an example? What are the roles that post-secondary um, institutions will play in helping inform uh, Artworks' framework and ways in moving forward? So I can briefly touch on this. Catherine, do you want me to start or do you want to? Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny, funny you bring this up because we were just talking about it about uh, an hour or two ago on another call. So partnering with other schools, you mentioned OCAD, you a huge supporter. Obviously, they're really good at what they do and the city uh, can do better um, working with, with institutions uh, as such. So we've, we've set up as part of Artworks um, MOUs, sort of connecting and, and solidifying some uh, discussion points on how we want to work together. So OCAD, you being one, we're working through with uh, University of Toronto as well, Scarborough and downtown, um, uh, universe, uh, Ryerson University. So all of these institutions uh, we're working with individually, um, but also for a common goal. Um, and one one pillar of the year of public art and the strategy is an evaluation process. How do we how do we create an evaluation process that that cheat that teaches us how to evaluate public art and how people feel about it. So, um, and how do we measure those? Like, what are the success, success metrics? How do, we, how do we measure success, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to create a bit of a template, if you will, or standardize it so we can track that data, um, you know, whether it's quarterly or annually for the years to come. And that will help us as a city and as a producer uh, point us in the right direction on, let's, again, let's stop doing that because that's not working. Let's do more of this. Um, so the evaluation and the measuring of success for all the bits and pieces that we go through as part of the 10-year public art strategy is a big part of the year itself um, in order to set that up, set that framework up so it can run for the next 10 years. Thank you so much. And um, in terms of measuring success and what that looks like and identifying those um, you know, key hallmarks in progression, Lisa, what does your um, personal art practice and when you're collaborating uh, with folks in creating you know, public art, what does success look like for you within your projects and for others? Um, I guess actually very specifically, uh, I remember feeling very successful when I did a Nuit Blanche in 2013 and mm -hmm. I built myself up. It was for with Patrick McCauley for Parade and I was a 26 foot woman and I had 15 foot video legs and I had a soundtrack. So it sounded like I was walking down university. And after Nuit Blanche, a mother had reached, she found, she Googled and found me and sent me an email that her five-year-old could not stop talking about the queen. Where does she get her shoes? Where does she live? How can she sleep in a bed? And I remember honestly thinking that that made for me, that project, an absolute complete success. So that's just a one example that really, I, I, I was able to create complete mm -hmm. magic for this small child that was that actually yeah and the mother reached out over a couple of years because they kept talking about the queen so that was an example of a small way um and and i guess with nuit blanche is again really like large numbers of eyes on projects for someone yeah especially in the disability community where you sort of might present very small to be uh, one of the main installations on a nuit blanche i was told there was five hundred thousand eyes i don't know if that was accurate but just it's just a whole different whole different world for someone like me to be able to really uh yeah sort of what feels like bring some magic and to really affect people's experiences thank you and it can be one person <laughs> again that's an artist's experience thank you yeah and i'll pass up the next question to david yeah thanks so much guys um so sort of switching uh direction of now uh, my next question is how will the city of Toronto address its history and public art sites that reference colonial legacy? Uh, for example, um, this summer we had we have seen artists in Toronto and around the world be arrested for voicing their community's concerns of colonial oppression. We will, will the Toronto public art strategy promote artists and their communities to be given a platform to create new work that can dialogue with existing monuments so that the voices of those who have been omitted throughout history can be given an opportunity to add our voices and our community's voices to our ever evolving historical narrative of the city and of Canada. I can repeat the question if you would like. It's a long question. I'm, I can repeat if you would like. Uh. 
uh, I don't think you need to repeat it, but it is it is a it is a big question, um, and I think um, part of part of the answer, just on a practical level, is that um, the city across many divisions at the moment is working on a lot of um, policy frameworks around uh, commemoration and memorialization of any anything in public space and i'm sure you've heard about the the renaming of dundas street and that was sort of a, a catalyst for a lot of thinking about a lot of other things as well of, of course as like edward the seventh and um a lot of things that happened across the summer um it's it's a a big discussion that includes a lot of things about how public space is accessed and used and named and even just sort of who is welcome there. And there's a lot of major um, public space issues that I think go with that. But um, I think it's really for the city anyway, it's going to be a, a fairly long process of community consultation about a lot of different spaces and monuments and you know even what parks are named and what libraries are named like there's so many things in public space that are named for people and events and um, rethinking all of those things is a really important and huge job that I think is going to take a while and is going to take a lot of feedback from a lot of a lot of the public sort of whether things especially when it comes to monuments whether things are removed or whether they're made into as you said a site that can be used for other interpretations or interventions with those things uh, whether it's a site for education and sort of recontextualization of things um, so i think that extends to a lot of the public realm that public art is part of or monuments some of them are artworks and some of them aren't um, but it's definitely a, a work in, in progress yeah, no, I really appreciate uh, your answer. It is very com complicated. Um, and, uh, you know, it feels like it would be a very a missed opportunity if we would just remove these monuments from as opposed to an intervention where um, a continuous dialogue of the narrative uh, can happen. Um, but thank you for your answer. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I right, extend this to Joe as well. Yeah, I just chime in here uh catherine's covered covered the important stuff um obviously it's a big question and we need to treat this very very delicately delicately and and properly right so um speaking from um the artworks to standpoint and how we're trying to do it within the year of public art and how, how we're trying to address some of these questions uh we'll be working with ken lum and uh, monument lab in order to to roll out a bit of a um uh, public engagement regarding monuments to hear what the public have to say about it. Um, and at the end, hopefully we'll have a project to show for it. We're just working through those details now, um, but you'll see something come come the launch of your public art. Um, and then that part, like the data collection and the people feedback part, we want to plug into the work that Catherine Dean is talking about. So this larger discussion citywide about renaming streets and monuments and so forth, and what that looks like going into council. Uh, and changing policy and, and uh, uh, getting approved through, through council, we want to we want to insert the data that we've collected for the year of public art into that larger conversation. So we're not duplicating efforts. We're not doing our own thing. We're trying to work together, understanding that it's a very very big conversation that's not going to be fixed in in days or weeks or months. Uh, but I do I do think we do need to give everyone some time to mourn uh, as part of this process, though, right? So. Um, and that and that is also something that we're trying to figure out as an organization. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I think that if um, even if the conversation is open to be had from um, from the year of public art, uh, I think that's uh, leading to a good direction for uh, for the different communities that are that are involved. Right. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if you had any. Uh, to add there, Lisa? If not, then I can go to the next question. Not specifically. No? Okay. <laughs> um, so my one of my other interests here are as an emerging artist, I'm, uh, I have been able to uh, get one public art 
uh, commission here in Ontario. Uh, I have had public art experience in South America. Um, so that's leading into my new question, which is, uh, what does mentorship opportunities uh, programming look like for the next generation artists who are interested in getting involved in public art creation? Catherine? Is that for me? <laughs> <laughs> sure. All, all my um, questions are for Catherine and Joe. Okay. Um, <laughs> That is that is something that is part of, of the strategy because it is something that we hear a lot from people that it's um, it's a difficult thing to know how to do if you've never done it before. Um, not all artists are necessarily interested in taking on interns or mentees um, to impart that kind of um, experience. So it's something that we are partly talking about as a mentorship program that we would be able to in some way facilitate, um, but also um, have other opportunities for artists that are not just the huge, <laughs> very expensive, you know, five year long projects so that there's a, there's a way for people to kind of ease their way into it a little bit. Um, in some ways, that's what the Toronto Sculpture Garden is intended to be. It's, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of work that needs to last outside for the most part for, you know, six months, sometimes over the winter. So it has a lot of the same components as a large scale, longer term piece, um, but without a lot of the construction issues that go with those things. Um, but it is definitely something that, that we're talking about as part of the implementation plan like how do we how do we provide more support for artists that we're working with sort of even now in the system that we have and what are the ways that we can make the entire experience better for people and also make people um, sort of more confident in applying to things even if they don't have as much experience as as other people may i just i'll just add on to that and then i'll pass to lisa sorry i want to make sure lisa has some airtime um so yeah, two, two programs in particular that will launch as part of our works um, within the year. And if they're successful, then we'll try to continue them on is our works to spotlight. And this is specifically for emerging artists to write in and tell us their stories. And then we bring awareness to them. Um, and we're not just awareness like social media posts, like try to do some mainstream uh, highlighting of some of the great talent that's out there in the communities that are done by by youth and some some younger younger folks, right? So that don't necessarily get the opportunity to share their story or even to apply to a public art uh, um, call. Um, second program uh, or the second element I would say is that we're as part of the new website, we're building a new, new website for, for the year of public art in order to consolidate all of the efforts across the city of Toronto. So that's internal. So that's consolidating the maps for city planning and, and you know, the new launches, the Catherine's public art office, uh, and Street Art Toronto, the um, graffiti art program. So it's right now it's up upwards to about 1,400 pieces on a map. Um, uh, sorry, a bit of a tangent there, but, but new website. And on as part of this website is that we plan to have an artist directory and an opportunity for artists emerging or mid-career in order to actually show, you know, maybe highlight their uh, their website so put, somebody can click on it and go learn about. Uh, learn about that artist and potentially that might result in some sales, especially now when people aren't traveling, they're not going to galleries, they're not, they're not spending money in the typical ways, maybe there's an opportunity to put money back in artist's pocket. So trying to, and, but with a focus on emerging. Um, sorry, is, is the website that is being, uh, being created by the city of Toronto, is that correct? Is that what you're saying, Joe? That's correct, yeah. So we'll pilot a new website for the uh, public art. And if everybody likes it, hopefully at the end we stick with it. Okay. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, we'll see how that turns out. Fantastic. That a database of public art of uh, Toronto and the GTA. Good yeah, stuff. And I, yeah, and just quickly, and that database will be larger than just uh, internal, right? We want to work with our partners in order to highlight whether it's BIA streetscapes or even some of that um, artworks that are in back alleys. I mean, it's, it's art. We need to put it on a map somewhere. We need to focus on the user, right? Whether you're a tourist or a Torontonian for that matter. If I'm looking, if I'm going for a walk, I want to know what that piece of art is. It doesn't necessarily need to be city produced or whatever. It just, mm. we just need to uh, be user focused. Fantastic. Um, 
Nice. David, you might actually just re-asking the question again for me. Uh, sure. This question was uh, particularly, uh, what does uh, mentorship opportunities programming look like for the next generation of artists who are interested in getting involved in public art creation? So I guess from my experience, I did find Louis Blanche was a really great place oh, to sort yeah. of step into that. It works with my kind of ideas. Actually, it's interesting that queen I talked about, I pitched a 15 foot queen, Patrick McCauley and the team had me up to 26. So that for <laughs> me, I was like, yes, that's what that's, this is my jam. Um, and then I did participate in We Blanche a lot. And I did feel like, yeah, it's, it's a, you have to have a good thing and you got to have a, a team. Um, but I feel like that was reasonable. I felt accessible. I, I was able to do that a few times and it was a real taste. And now I feel like I already feel the benefits of being a part of Artworks. I feel like it definitely, uh, just even I mean, when we were starting to get the permits for this summer, I got to say the team there, like I really had a lot of additional actual support. There was folks, I, I didn't have to figure anything out. They were like, here's who you talk to, you do this. Um, and I already feel the benefits, yeah, of the support that way. I could see how it'd be intimidating. Um, but again, I had my caravan truck project when I saw the artworks call and it really felt like a really great fit. And then it reignited in me, the, 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 like I said, how Nuit Blanche was really important. Um, and I guess that's just even just one detail from my past. When I was in high school, I went to Europe and I remember around Christmas in Vienna, the public performance. I remember seeing a Christmas play uh, was clearly their best actors in the most amazing costumes. It wasn't like the churchy things you see here. And it had that, that transportive effect. And I remember like, I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. And it's actually now with artworks, I'm remembering, I was like, my goodness, I'm actually going to be doing that in nine different communities all over Toronto next summer, in two summers, 2022. So I'm so pleased. So I, so I, anyway, I, I do feel like, yeah, these kind of things, it can feel really overwhelming to put a huge thing together. And now I've already, I've raised 108,000. I'm going to probably be raising 200,000 to put this together properly. It's huge, but I feel like artwork supports it. It makes it feel very doable um, for me. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I think that's a, a great lead to our uh, final question here, which is, um, I guess, bringing it back to COVID <laughs> as we started. Um, public art as public health. How does public art aim to support the collective mental and emotional health of the city of Toronto? I'll, I'll quickly lead and then yeah pass to my colleagues so I, I mentioned some of it before just about letting culture and our lead lead recovery um, as, as we know people are going through some tough times um, you know even when you think they're not they are and uh, I think art music culture uh, helps bring joy um, you know I think it was Lisa talking about memorable experiences uh, and we need to create those experiences in order to improve, um, you know, our, our mental well-being. Uh, and how do you do that? I mean, we lean on our artists in order to do that. So it's it's a reality. I don't go to my banker when when I want to feel good. Uh, I you know I, I go to a show. I go to a concert. I go to whatever. So um, I I, I mean I'm being I'm trying to be funny here, but you I think you understand what I'm saying. So. Um, it's, it's a bit of a win-win, but we need to be careful not to burn out our, our sector, right? Our arts and culture sector, because we're gonna be leaning on them a lot. I say it's a win-win because um, the sector has been hardest hit, maybe the most out of uh, the sectors. Of course, small business is hurting right now, um, but uh, I think we can, by putting money into artists' pockets, gets people back up on their feet. And then the, you know, the result of that is that uh, uh, the the audience feels feels much better. So um, memorable experiences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I would. Uh, I think I would just add to that that one of the things that public art can do is really provide a sense of place and belonging for people. And I think especially um, as part of. A, public realm, sort of in the whole public realm that supports the collective well-being of people in the city. Like, I think probably a lot of us spending more, times in our, more time in our neighborhoods over the last year have realized that it'd be nice to have more green space, it'd be nice to have more trees, it'd be nice to have more places to sit outside that were, you know, beautiful and gave you a way to get out of your house. 
And I think public art is sometimes expected to do all of those things, but it actually functions better when it's supported by a really strong public realm. And that's something that, um, that I think is an important part of the strategy too, is working more in collaboration with other city divisions who do that kind of work as well, so that we can really make something amazing for everybody. Yeah, I guess to, um, to continue that thought is uh, as opposed to having public art as just being an object occupying space, but sort of viewing public art as an invitation to creating space of gathering. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess that's, uh, that's cultural. Uh, how is it that we occupy the public space? Yeah, um, exactly. yeah. thank you so much, Catherine. I appreciate it. You're Kais, I'm not sure if you had anything to add to that. Thank you. Um, yeah, and Lisa, if there's anything that you had wanted to share in the same periphery, if you would, on how, again, it's helped you support you um, in your process of making as an artist, <clears throat> uh, being public art and um, projects that you're currently working on. Yeah, and I suppose too, just with the collective mental health, one yeah. thing I'm really keen to do with this project, because we have made it specifically for the disabled community and all, all over the place, these folks are often not invited, like there's nothing for them. So I'm really keen with each community partner. I have a local disability community partner, and I'm really keen to actually reach out and to say to all these folks where art and experiences are really not for them, we have something for you. So that just came to mind with that last question. I really think that that's important. And that's what I, in my little tiny way, am going to do uh, towards the collective mental health through public art um, to just really have a community that's really underserviced, have a, have a little bit of magic that we're going to drive near them somewhere and they can come. So Thank that's you. just my thought. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you, Catherine, Joe, and Lisa. Uh, we'd like to take the next um, half an hour to open up the floor to our audience for um, questions or comments that you may have. And I'd also just like to acknowledge this one comment that we have received. Once the libraries open up again, they would also be a great vehicle for receiving feedback from the public, as well as promoting further understanding about contemporary art, what it has been, what it is, and could it be. So I think that's also a good acknowledgement in how we can, you know, sort of leverage the existing bodies that we have in terms of receiving community feedback and like shaping our public art uh, strategy and uh, creation. If anybody has any other questions, please feel free to uh, unmute or please feel uh, free to use the chat function as well, whichever is most accessible for you. Not seeing anything in the chat or. Anything on. Again, um, mentorship, what that could look like, what you'd like to see as, as an artist, uh, should you be enrolled in a residency through artworks? What does the process look like? Um, I was just going to add with the mentorship, just because mm -hmm. actually I was a filmmaker for most of my mm -hmm. life before I got sick. I've actually had 30 different interns that I've trained up and they're now working in the film business. I, 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 I'm learning with public art. I feel like I am also emerging, mm -hmm. but moving forward, I'd be very keen, yeah, mm -hmm. to mentor in this way of thinking and this kind of way of art producing, especially with the sort of more pop-up-y things that I do. So I'm going to, yeah, I want to I know that's not really the question, but that just sort of popped up as something that I am keen to do and think towards mentorship and also learning myself because I'm also while I've been doing art for a long time, mm -hmm. this is sort of newish for me. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm really keen to know more and see more what this 10 years of public art looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I, I think I can, oh, sorry, I think I can add in, uh, I'm sorry. I think somebody, uh, Jane, you were able to ask a question. I, I was just thinking um, about the general public and how little um, they seem to know about public art and contemporary art in general. And how can we um, help promote <laughs> all that public art can be, I guess. Um, I don't know if it's giving workshops to teachers in the schools to create an audience for the future, or if it's more media coverage or as I say, maybe talks in libraries. I, I'm just um, 
just like talking to family members they really don't have a clue <laughs> and i really it's sad it's so sad because there is so much going on that's so wonderful and they just don't know about it i don't know if maybe the panelists have some ideas along those lines to incorporate it into that to incorporate that into the public strategy somehow in a, in a more in a broader way somehow just thoughts thanks thank you so much jane great uh Great question and comment there, Jane, and happy to answer because it's basically what we've set out to do is to raise awareness, not only for the existing collection that's citywide um, in, you know, it's in the hundreds, of course, over a thousand pieces um, and how to reach, how to reach all Torontonians uh, to make sure they see, see themselves reflected in the public art program moving forward. So yeah, we're, we, we are working with, um, uh, Toronto public libraries to get into, it's really nice to work with people that have bricks and mortar uh you know in the many in the plentiful uh, also with tdsb we have a couple of programs we're working with tdsb so that's not only citywide but it's also youth focused so um trying to create try to get students to engage and do artworks that potentially get put up on billboards around the city so really saying that no matter how big or small you are like you can you can do this right and we want to be able to foster some of those some of those um you know emerging emerging artists but um, at base, Jane, that's that's what we're dedicated. That's where we're we're setting out to to do. And I'm sure Catherine and Lisa might might have some other comments there for sure. I'm just so pleased to hear that because I feel like so many young artists feel like they just hear no all the time. That's too big. That's too expensive. No, no, no. So I'm I'm personally one of my ma mandates is for to young artists to let them know yes that things are possible. You just have to kind of find a way. So I'm really pleased to hear that. And trust me, just a just a last point on this. Trust me, we understand like the process of how to commission art and why, you know, when we're dealing with a big commission, let's say, it needs to go to an experienced artist for for a couple of reasons. I'm sure everybody would understand, right? That it's a it's a big deal. It's their legacy pieces, big budgets, um, and they need the experience of how to produce and how to work with a fabricator and all those things. Um, but in tandem, we also need to teach. We need to have a bit of education, right? We need to teach the emerging artists how to do that. So. Um, we do have a couple of programs as part of Artworks uh, that will hopefully live on and uh, working with folks like Catherine Dean and, and other colleagues in order to in order to teach how to, you know, one of the one of the opportunities with Artworks is that we're cutting through some of the red tape at City Hall advancing, you know, it was so nice to hear Lisa, uh, you talk about how the Artworks team really helps you to connect with whether it's a parks and rec rep or, um, you know, transportation if you need a street permit. Or, or what it is. So we're really trying to cut through that some of the red tape in order to get artists to the people and cut, try to reduce some of the bureaucracy getting in the way um, in order to advance their career. So they understand what they need to do next time they need to do a project like that. So uh, that's also an advantage of, uh, of, of the year public garden. Hopefully that lives on. Thank you. Um, the question, um, so this is a comment, sorry. I just love the conversation and the way language is shifting around the role of public art, as well as the focus on bringing uh, people in through mentorship. Uh, great work to the city of Toronto, uh, lots to look forward to, and uh, with thanks for the 10 year public art strategy. Thank you for the comments as well. Um, and another uh, question or comment, I feel like for me, the mentorship would be important as not sure how to deal with uh, the cold or heat aspect and how many tools of making a project um, a success. So there's a lot of, again, emphasis here on like the importance of mentorship and like what are some of those opportunities look like for our emerging artists, um, you know, are they coming directly out of post-secondary uh, institutions? And if not, so again, for artists who do not uh, choose to go through those uh, mainstream channels of education into which those you know, public spaces provide uh, the opportunity for networking and those opportunities to, you know, easily be accessible to those artists. But, you know, how are we looking at mentorship in terms of outreaching to those post-secondary institutions, but also for folks who do not, uh, who are self-taught and who do not, you know, access those mainstream uh, channels as well. Um, so, and another question here. Uh, as a middle-aged woman and a mental health survivor, I'm a member of Workman Arts and I sing, dance and write songs. What will be the best way for me to proceed? 
um, in terms of, um, and, and I believe this question is positioned to uh, finding and identifying opportunities for mentorship. So either within uh, the public art st strategy itself, but um, for folks, if you're either a writer or a singer, um, a performance or a visual artist, what are some of those um, avenues for obtaining mentorships and creating those relationships? Uh, would you give um, advice to uh, either Lisa, Joe, Catherine? What have your experiences been like in terms of finding mentorship? How did you obtain them? Where did you go? I've actually, I'm huge on mentorship. I, starting from when I was really young, I would just do cold emails to people that I really admired and ask for different mentorships. So it's like a huge thing for me. And I've always mentored a lot of folks as well. Um, I think, I guess what, when I do suggest it to folks, if it's for the first time, um, I really do suggest they find someone that's doing something like what they like to do that seems compatible and reach out. And a mentorship could be as simple as a few emails. It could be something more specific, but I really see it as an opportunity. And actually the person who helped me decide to switch to a caravan out of a gallery was someone I had gone to for mentorship who is now producing my project. So you never know like how things can kind of go, but I'm a big fan of that. And I know it can feel really overwhelming. I do teach a creative consultation workshop at Workman. And that's the kind of thing I really direct folks towards that. There's also now a, a great mentorship program with the Neighborhood and Ar Arts Network that has a huge list of amazing mentors. I'd highly recommend uh, people check that out so they can then have a 45 minute free session with someone that's, uh, that can really help guide you. And the Neighborhood Arts Network is also looking to make those so you can have ongoing mentorship within the program. So I'd really recommend looking into that. Thank you, Lisa. I, I'm, so I'm uh, just to jump in here. I'm seeing a lot of uh, conversation regarding education, education regarding public art to the public who has no idea of how these projects uh, sort of manifest the whole process and also education to artists who are wanting to tap into creating public art. Um, from my own personal experience um, in Rio de Janeiro working for, uh, for uh, Samba schools, uh, creating large scale sculptures, um, there are, the city does provide large scale warehouses for the production of this work where people are invited to come and see the production of the work because they only normally see the 40 minute parade of these ginormous floats. Like this is like the biggest party in the world. Um, but when you, if you demystify the whole process from looking at the sketches, seeing how they're enlarged, seeing the whole process of it, people have a better understanding of the process and have a better appreciation of the process as well. Um, and this, I feel that can work both for the artists involved in public art and for the public who are gonna be living with public art. Uh, I think there has to be a lot of education uh, that could come through the mentorship program, for example. And it could just be like putting out to the public, this is how this work was created from start to finish and being transparent about it. Thank you, David. Uh, another comment. Um, also enjoyed the conversation, especially like the way the city is being open, shifting, responding to desires and needs of both artists and the public. Thank you. And uh, we also do have another question. This question is directed to Lisa first and to Joe and to Catherine. However, <clears throat> Uh, I loved your description of the playful immersive piece uh, you're developing, Lisa. I'm curious if there's any connection to radical or political clowning that feels meaningful to you. More broadly, in the context of budgetary slash grant pressures, how can public art make space for work that provokes as well as delights? And let me know if you'd like me to reread the question again. Um, I will respond first. Um... I suppose um, I don't actually know very much about clowning. Actually at that same Louis Blanche I referred to earlier, I worked a little bit with the ecstatic clown factory and I remember loving the universe and thinking the clown universe was close to mine, but my work actually came through my own madness. And I literally, I'm not trained in anything. I've just jumped in literally in order to save my life with my, with my madness and my disability. But I feel like clowning really does resound with me. So that's just to answer that first little bit of question. Um, and the second bit, how can public art make space for work that provokes as well as delights? 
Um, I suppose, uh, yeah, I, I suppose for, for me, I'm really interested in delighting and then it's delighting. And actually I've got a thing I want to say. So I feel like that's maybe what you're describing. I'm trying, my universe is to kind of, uh, yeah, um, delight and astonish while being like, hey, and by the way, here's this info that you might not know about disabled folks. So I feel like that's my way of, of trying to do that because I am, I feel like I'm a storyteller and an entertainer first. And I do believe in dark times. It's our job as artists to be honest about where we're at and then dream up the new future. I truly believe that. So that's my way of trying to do it. Yeah, just wanting to, uh, to maybe underscore uh, Lisa's comments there. So um, I would lead with let artists do what they do and that is to create. Um, whether it's playful or political or what have you. Uh, and I would say sitting in a chair at City Hall um, and running a, you know, a grant process or an application process for the year of public art, let's say, uh, and seeing all the applications come through, some of them, some of them are intense. Um, you know, it's, it's the truth. And when we start to feel uncomfortable, that's when it gets exciting. Um, and like when we start having these conversations uh, and, and pressing upon uh, the bureaucracy or politics or, or social environment, whatever that social climate, whatever that might be, that's when we go, okay, now, now let's figure out how to make this project happen. Uh, and that, that to me is exciting, but uh, leave it to the artists to do what they do best because uh, sometimes we pretend we're good artists, but uh, we're not as, as bureaucrats. <laughs> um, I think the only thing I would add to, to that is that that can also be where um, some of that education or information comes in so that you know that whatever those ideas are they're being conveyed to people and and they're getting it like i know that we have some artworks that people do not get and maybe are provoked by but some of that is that they they haven't in a way that when you're at a museum you can always ask somebody you can you can read the you can read the wall text, you can listen to the audio guide or whatever the options are. Public art doesn't very often have that kind of backup. And so I think one of the one of the really important things about that kind of information for the public is also understanding what those amazing ideas are in those pieces. Thank you. Um, another uh, comment from uh, an attendee, Heather. I also have mentored in formal and informal ways. I know many older artists who are open to being contacted through email or social media. It doesn't need to be through an, in, an institution. When it works, it is wonderful for both. Just go for it. The worst is to hear, the worst is to hear that the artist does not have the time. So again, just tapping into that idea of, you know, as best as you can, putting yourself out there. The worst thing that um, you know you can receive is no response at all. But there's definitely a lot of artists um, being mid-career level to establish artists who are open and who are willing to help folks uh, mentor that um, to, into get, getting mentorship and support through their art practice as well. Thank you, Heather, for the encouragement. And if there's any other questions that folks may have. I was just wondering, uh, maybe Catherine, you can speak to this uh, regarding um, uh, mentorship, the uh, mentorship program, if there may be incentives for uh, an established artist who has taken on or who has proposed a public art um, commit, who has received a public art commission, is there any incentive for them to sort of work with uh, different, uh, the different pillars that is being proposed through this new program? Uh, to take on uh, students or emerging artists? Um, I think that's a, I think that's a possibility. Um, we do have, um, I know that actually it's interesting through the, um, through city planning's 1% program, they do often require developers to have a mentorship program through their public art commissions. Um, some of that is that it's, um, the developers work through a slightly different process. They have different staff. They have just different ways of doing things. Um, it's something that we would definitely like to have as part of our program in some way as well. And I think that it's just a matter of figuring out project by project, since they're all so different, sort of what works best, like whether it's the artist directly um, providing the mentorship, 
um, or whether it's us being more in the lead on it, if it's an artist who, whose practice doesn't really allow for that, or if they're not in the city, or I mean, there's a lot of different reasons that people might not, um, might not sort of take on that work. But I think, I mean, this has been incredibly useful just hearing all the comments from everybody, like just all the things that we can incorporate into our thinking about this. And it's obviously something that is lacking at the moment and that we can that we can do something about. Thank you. Uh, probably just to hop on there too, you know, Catherine's totally right with the percent for public art and the developers having to include uh, mentorship. Um, Street Art Toronto uh, and the mural program, they really focus in on mural, uh, sorry, on mentorship. So it's it's kind of like, I don't know if it's half and half, but I'll just, for conversational sake, I'll just say it's it's half creating the art and the artwork in situ, but it's also half teaching, mentoring, um, using an established artist to, uh, to work with a, a younger artist, emerging artist, in order to learn the business so they can sustain themselves, they can make money and they can make a living doing what they love to do, and that's creating art. Uh, you know, uh, also Nui Blanche has a great program, uh, Nui Connects. So it's only a couple of years old. Um, first year they they were mentoring um, a Rise out of Scarborough, uh, and the mentorship opens up the doors of City Hall. So they're able to come in and ask questions from the producing team, specifically Nui Blanche. So they're able to sit around the table, learn about fundraising, learn about marketing and promotion, and all the things that aren't necessarily art related. Um, last year it was. Uh, uh, the mentoree was uh, Mark Stodar, um, who is who is great, you know, close friend to, to Rise as well at Scarborough. Um, so I'm not sure what they'll do this year or the next year, but uh, there are some opportunities there that have that have shown some great output. Great, thanks. And we have another comment here. David's comments reminded me of 401 Richmond, the Gladstone or Harborfront artist studios, where the public spaces can see the working process. We need more spaces like this, and they need the support of the city um, to exist and survive without huge uh, tax cuts. Oh, sorry, without huge taxes. Sorry. Thank you. Um, then another question just recently popped up. Are there any other ways that the city is looking at documenting the process of the work created, especially the ones that still run on digital platforms for the year of public arts, besides the website? One, one opportunity that comes to mind is uh, we're going to roll out something called Artworks TO Tours. So that are, uh, these are um, guided tours um, driven by Arts, uh, sorry, Driftscape. So Driftscape is an existing uh, native app. Some of you might have, might use it. Um, so we're, we're, we're curating tours, one in each ward, uh, to, bring, to bring attention to the existing collection. Uh, the reason I say that is um, we're collecting media to be a part of these digital tours. So whether it's an art like the artist talking about the background of the project and how it came to be or how it was originally unsuccessful and then successful. And so just really trying to um, trying to dig deep on how these projects came to be and getting the artist to be front and center and public facing. So if I'm a viewer walking down the street looking at this public art, I'm actually relating to this artist. Um, so these are we're trying to draw out some of those stories. Also scrape the internet for media, for news um, on when that might've been created or, or you know, maybe a car ran into it you know, six years ago and then it was rebuilt. Like just interesting stories, right? That, that try to shape, uh, shape the stories of these artworks. I see David laughing there, sorry. Late in the day. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm laughing because I've, uh, my background is also with uh, conservation work for artwork. So there is a lot of his, history within different monuments and sculptures, public sculpture, uh, that is only told within the con people who are dealing with construction and, or conservation or restoration of public art, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's a long history that unfortunately the public doesn't know the history until unless you're speaking to them on site oh, while you're, yeah. Yeah, there's so many juicy stories there, David, coming from, you know, producing uh, I don't know, 13 Nuit Blanches on that team, like how projects come to be. And, you know, Lisa could probably attest to this as well. It's such an interesting process of a year or, you know, 18 months of working with artists and back and forth. And um, and uh, even the week leading up to like a Nuit night and how things come together, it's just bonkers. If people only knew. I did always make time lapses of mine coming together. 
if anyone's ever interested, I can show. But yeah, it is incredible. I remember with the big queen, the trucks pulled up. I was like, it's like an Elton John concert, like just to bring the stuff. Cause I was to hold, like to have me 26 feet up. It was essentially a building they put underneath me. So it was really incredible. Yeah, that whole experience. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions within the chat. Um, and again, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you to our panelists for your time, your insights. Thank you so much, David, for helping guide the conversation in public art. And um, again, everyone, please have a great rest of your day. If you have any other questions, um, you can feel free to um, email me in the follow up. My email is uh, kais at underscore padamshi at workmanarts.com. If you have any other questions about the panels um, themselves or any of the other events series too. Thank you so much for tuning in. Take care. Thank everybody. you guys. Thank you, David.